a revenue problem. And uh, one of the ways that we need to address that is to, uh, to tax the highest earners in the country. Uh, we need to address our revenue generation through um, taxing the, the highest 1%, um, increasing our um, tax rates. Um, the, um, the budget that has come out recently is uh, certainly going to get us there. It increases the highest wage earners to uh, upwards of 49%. Um, and then additionally, we need to address our uh, bleeding, uh, both literally and uh, metaphorically, in the, the endless wars that we continue to fight overseas. And by bringing our troops home and reducing our, our um, defense spending, we can address our revenue issues there as well. So, um, you know, it's about revenue, it's not about deficits, and um, the more we can get people back to work, the more we're going to address our overall deficit problem in the future. Thank you. Well, when we're spending $10 billion a month on an overseas war effort, I think that's one of the first places to start in reducing our deficit. We launched a war at the same time we cut taxes, and when you have Warren um, Buffett saying, please tax me some more, I think we have an obligation to help him uh, realize his dreams. <laughs> and, and I also think there's an opportunity for us to take a look at Social Security, raising the cap so that wealthier people are paying more, um, eliminating the oil subsidies. The oil companies have made more money in the depth of this recession than at any other time in history, and yet the taxpayers are still subsidizing them. Let's reinvest those resources into a clean energy future. I have served on a board of supervisors, been responsible in my capacity for 2,000 employees. We've balanced our budget. We have a AAA bond rating, a healthy reserve, low debt, and I've demonstrated that I can deliver the goods in, in a healthy budget, and I want to do that in Washington. The, I, don't, I agree with, uh, with my colleagues here. I think we have plenty of money. The problem is it's being siphoned off to the wealthiest 1%, whether it's the, the military industrial complex or the $28 billion we give the oil companies. Why do we give them $28 billion? I don't get it. This one, is, this one let, let me explain this one. Right now we give $14 billion to roughly six multinational food corporations who, who, run, our, who run agriculture. They in turn kick back many millions of dollars to, well, for instance, Lynn Woolsey took $5,000 from the sugar industry. This is the corruption in Washington where money buys votes and power. And we have, for instance, a food policy right now that is causing the generation born today to not live as long as their parents, and where one out of three children will develop diabetes, and where Congress fought the World Health Organization when the World Health Organization said that diets should not contain more than 10% sugar. Congress said, no, we need 25% sugar, and we're going to give them a subsidy on top of it. So the goal of any budget, I think, should really be threefold. One is to strengthen our middle class. Two is to make sure that it supports our economic recovery. And three is to chart a course to deficit reduction. And if we're not doing all three, then we haven't got the right budget. So how do we make sure we're investing in things like education and small business and infrastructure to support our growth going forward, which is going to create the tax base for which we can um, reduce the deficit? And how do we do that now? So uh, my colleagues have mentioned a few areas that I think are really key. One is uh, the revenue side equation, making sure that tax reform can bring in the revenue that we need to fund our investment now. Uh, so making sure that we're re uh, repealing the Bush tax cuts for those making over 250000 a year, making sure that something like the Buffett rule is in place for those that are making millions to pay their fair share, making sure we're capping deductions and looking at things like capital gains rates and carried interest in a way that can help us bring in the revenue now. The other is to reduce expenses, and ob the obvious place for that is in our military spending to reduce our uh, huge budget for uh, war. In 1979, top 1% 1 had 8% of the nation's wealth. By 2007, they had 23%, and it came from the rest of us. They've literally sucked the money out of our economy, and they've slowed the driver of the engine so that it's going kaput. They've got $2 trillion dashed away. There is no problem not having enough money. These people, someone called Stacy's um, 
phone call once and said, you know how many shops there are in our district in high school? There are four, and there's one full-time teacher. There used to be 40. Okay, they are cutting the blood out of us. They're cutting the meat. They are destroying our government, local and federal. Uh, we've wasted $10 trillion on the Cold War to fight this specter called the Soviet Union that we thought was going to invade us. The Soviet Union was never going to do that. We spent 3 to $5 trillion on Iraq and Afghanistan. There's plenty of money to do what we have to do. What we have to do is just get it from the people who took it from us, the richest of the rich, and we have to put the money into our community so we can do the things I've been telling you we have to do to deal with the climate crisis. Along with cutting the military budget, which I've been working on for decades, uh, two key aspects to reduce the deficit in a responsible uh, job creation way uh, is first, single-payer health care, and the other is to tax Wall Street. I've co-chaired the Health Care Not Warfare campaign with Congressman John Conyers, who has endorsed me in this race. He says he wants me at his side to help pass two of the key bills that he has on the floor right now trying to pass through Congress. Uh, one is H.R. 676, the main federal single-payer health care bill, which would certainly reduce the deficit and help small businesses uh, to get off the floor. Uh, and the other is the Humphrey Hawkins 21st Century Full Employment Training Act, which not only would provide for full employment and therefore hugely increase tax revenues and narrow the deficit, but also a one-quarter of one percent transaction tax on Wall Street, which would yield $150 billion with a B dollars a year. That's really something to fight for. Um, we've spent nearly an additional $2 trillion more than we had, bringing us up to close to $16 trillion of deficit. Um, that's our children's future and our children's children's future, and we need to do something with that. Uh, the super committee with this $1.2 trillion challenge couldn't even talk, could make no headway, and now we're facing a sequester of $600 billion in domestic and $600 billion in military. Uh, with a Republican-controlled uh, Congress, that $600 billion in military is going to be a very difficult thing to exact. Uh, facing $600 billion in domestic, a lot of our uh, wish list kind of safety nets are going to be evaporating further. Um, it's going to be a very, very, very difficult uh, period going forward. Um, revenues would be good, obviously taxation and transactions and Wall Street is important. Corporate uh, taxes where huge companies have no uh, are paying no taxes, oil industries are being subsidized, these are all things that need to be addressed. But these are the people that run Congress. They've been there for 20, 30 years, they run the committees, they got the control. You know, when you go last in a crowded field on a question where everybody agrees, uh, you sit here thinking, God, how can I make that sound different? I, I can't put it to rhyme or song or anything, so uh, I guess I will just uh, reiterate uh, what you've heard from others. Uh, I actually do want to start, though, by saying I think we do have a, a problem. And you've got $15 trillion in, in, in debt, uh, and you've got these, these big debts. You have to deal with it. That doesn't mean you need the extreme austerity and shock doctrine uh, of the Paul Ryan budget. You have to be smart about how you deal with it. And extreme austerity will actually kick the economy into another recession, which could make the debt and deficit worse. So uh, as you've heard from others, I support reductions in military spending. I support elimination of subsidies to big oil. I support tax fairness and the Buffett rule and allowing the Bush tax cuts to expire. And I support the number one thing we can do about this problem, which is getting people back to work and getting this economy moving again. If we do that, and I think President Obama's jobs, American Jobs Act is a good starting point. I want to do more, but it's a good start. Uh, we can tackle this debt and deficit issue. Next question comes from the audience. War is completely absent from this discussion. Not really, because we have talked about it a little bit. How would you bring our troops home, and what would you do to prevent eternal war? Last part? Thank you. What would you do to prevent eternal war? Well, I have a brother that served in the military until just his recent retirement. Uh, 26 years, and he has served seven tours overseas since September 11th. And the, the fact that we went to this war under false pretenses, that Congress was not engaged in really making the decision about whether or not to launch it, I think were some pretty significant problems. The expense associated with it, not only with what we're dealing with now, but 
the lives of these men and women that are coming home to us and not leaving the war theater behind. While my brother still has all of his body parts on him, his head and his heart are different. And we're looking at our next wave of veterans that are going to be coming into our community needing services. And we haven't done a very good job with the veterans that we already have in place. War is not the answer. Economic development, not only at home but abroad. People like Heidi Kuhn and Greg Mortensen who have been demonstrating how when you invest in communities, they start thriving and not looking to war. I think that we need to be taking some approaches toward peace instead of war. It seems that most wars start over a fight over uh, a natural resource or access to a waterway or something like that. And so our addiction to oil right now has us in the Middle East and has us very firmly entrenched in the Middle East, Afghanistan, other parts of the world, where our endless need for burning carbon has, uh, has, has got us stuck. I think that uh, we've got to stop being the world's cop. We spend our national defense, we spend more than all other nations together. Uh, I believe that we have to use the United Nations more. We need to work with, uh, like we, I think in Libya, where the Susan Adams and that's, uh, Hillary Clinton and the United, <laughs> Nations, uh, the United <laughs> Nations gal. Uh, uh, in Libya, it was, it was a <laughs> reason from behind. And uh, uh, thank you. And that uh, we're, we're, we're not trying to do it all ourselves. I think we need a strong national defense, of course we do. But we, if we get off of our oil, I think that we can, um, we, can, we, can end, we can end that. Thank you. I come from a family of veterans. My father was uh, actually in uh, the Navy. My grandpa fought in World War II, and my uncle is a colonel in the Air Force. And I have great honor and respect for how they serve our country. Uh, and also know that we're spending a massive amount of money on war. We spent over 45% of the world's budget on making war. We're forward deployed in over 130 countries. We have bases in places that are not necessary for our national defense. And I'll often ask people, um, given my work overseas, I've actually um, been to the Middle East five times. I've uh, done humanitarian and aid work and community development in Southeast Asia and India. And I'll ask folks, how much do you think we spend on foreign aid? And they say, well, we should spend no more than 10%. We spend a fraction of 1% on foreign aid in our budget. And that money that goes towards doing things like creating education, infrastructure, and economic development within countries that uh, desperately need it, that are creating the terrorists that cause us ultimately to decide to go to war later, that those investments could pay huge dividends. We need to take our, our military budget and reinvest a meaningful portion of that into foreign aid to make sure we have a safe world. The first thing we have to do is stop voting for Republicans and centrist Democrats to send us to war. I'm the only candidate here who's talking about empire. The United States has an empire because we have what's called a military Keynesian economy. We spend money on the military to stimulate the economy instead of doing what we did in World War II, which was, well, we used military spending there, but the New Deal was about getting the money into the working class and using that to stimulate the economy. So I think what we have to do is retreat the empire, remove our bases in about half at least of the 150 nations that have some kind of military facility. We can convert them into ecotopian resource centers so that people don't lose their jobs. Um, <clears throat> nothing less than that is going to stop these wars because we have, as I mentioned, these monsters who are running the country. So going in and just kind of arguing, oh, we've got to stop this war here, that's not going to cut it. We have to organize the nation. We have to organize the nation to move away from what we're doing. And I have to disagree with what Norman said about foreign policy. I mean, if you're only thinking about war and peace, it's foreign policy. But I've been working on international issues ecologically with people in 40 countries for 30 years. I've been involved in CISPIS, Green Party, worked on Chernobyl. I'm even working in Slovakia right now. As an independent progressive Democrat, I'm mindful of what John F. Kennedy said, sometimes party loyalty asks too much. That's why in December 2008, with President-elect Obama considering his options in Afghanistan, I went on Washington Journal on C-SPAN for 45 minutes essentially pleading that the incoming administration not escalate the war in Afghanistan. Instead, there was a tripling of the troop levels in that country. That's why independently I went to Afghanistan and came back and wrote and spoke, TV, radio, newspapers, let's stop this escalation. 
been working against war for decades, writing, speaking, organizing, policy analysis, provided several members of Congress with a paper analyzing the situation in Afghanistan after I returned in the early fall of 2009. And I said in these words, the wheels are coming off policy. Uh, there's too much deference to the Democrat in the White House by Democrats who don't want to directly challenge this escalation of war, what Dr. King called the madness of militarism. You know I will do that in Congress. Um, as that $600 billion cut in military expenditures occurs across this next year, it is going to be an amazing scene, making the deficit uh, debacle uh, look kind of minor. It, it really is going to be an eye-opener as to how politics really run in Congress. Uh, besides the foreign wars and the troops in 130 countries, we're in the midst of a domestic war. Um, this, this particular budget, the uh, NDA budget that just came out this last December, authorizes FEMA and its internment camps, and there are an incredible number of these internment camps that are springing up. We live in a uh, zone called the Constitutional Free Zone, within 100 miles of the border. Um, you no longer have uh, protection from unreasonable search and, uh, uh, and arrest, and then if they decide to call you a terrorist, they can put you away forever or assassinate you if they want to. The, the war is being brought to our, um, to our own home, and we need to be paying attention to that. Um, one of my patients was torn from the breast. I'll tell you more about that later. How do we end endless war? How do we prevent endless war? First, uh, I will push back against President Obama in Afghanistan. I think we need to be out of there now. I think it's past time to withdraw our troops and bring them home. I oppose the Iraq war from the beginning, and I will oppose any war of choice, any uh, invasion or military uh, action against a country that hasn't threatened or attacked us. Um, Larry mentioned energy independence and uh, alternative energy source, a huge part of how you're going to avoid this country being in perpetual war. And I'm proud that I've received every environmental endorsement in this race from environmental groups. I've been legislating in this area, and I will take that leadership to Congress, absolutely. Last, I just want to mention that you've got to be able to stand up to the military-industrial complex. The closest corollary we have to that in California is the prison-industrial complex. And I have stood up to them in a big, big way. You uh, know that I fought for five years to stop a hugely uh, expensive and unnecessary expansion of death row at San Quentin. It was a, a long-standing fight, but we prevailed. We saved the state $1.6 billion, and that's the kind of approach I'll take to the military-industrial complex as well. Well, you've heard the saying that the personal is political, and the political is personal for me. Um, with a number of family members having served in numerous wars um, through generations, I have a personal experience of what that means on families. And um, having seen my father grapple with that every day of his life until his death, and to see my brother struggle with that after having served um, during the first, um, the second Iraq war, um, these are, are deeply personal issues for me. I, um, I saw my, my adopted niece change dramatically after serving in the Baghdad airport as a military police. And so um, it's important that we bring these troops home immediately. And then additionally, we can certainly um, prevent future wars through diplomatic efforts in reaching out to countries in the Middle East and um, throughout the world to address our common goals of r achieving renewable energy and um, decreasing the need for nuclear energy and its um, after effects completely. Thank you. What are your views on illegal immigration and what would you do to change it? Mr. Fritzland, go first. Thank you. Um, I, I favor the DREAM Act. I think I, I, I agree with uh, Governor Brown that it is just not right to take a family with children and send them out uh, of the country. Um, we have to deal with our borders. We have to deal with, uh, with, uh, with immigration. But we have to do it humanely. And right now, I'll go right back to my core cause uh, uh, issue here, which is getting money out of politics. 
is that people are not sitting down and using common sense solutions to, co to, to solve our big problems. They're more interested in squabbling with each other and fighting with each other. And, um, and so I think we get right back down to the core cause, the root cause of all of this is too much money in politics and the people that are taking it from the special interests. So I know this is a very controversial issue, but um, if you really look at America, you have to sort of face the facts that we're all immigrants. We all come from somewhere, and this country has been built off the power and smarts of, of our immigrants. And so I think we need comprehensive immigration reform. We need to have a clear pathway to citizenship for those families that have been working and toiling in our communities, who've abided by the law and who've been good citizens, uh, to give them the safety and security of becoming US citizens. And in particularly, we can't, Particularly, we, we can't be um, jeopardizing or um, punishing the, ki the kids. So we need to make sure that all children have highly valuable, accessible, high quality education. Uh, the, I'm a huge supporter of the DREAM Act. I'm glad that passed here in California, and I think we need to make that happen nationwide. And I also think we need to be really clear about things like our H-1B visa program and making sure that we have right access to the skills and talents of those that are coming to our country to be educated in terms of incorporating them in our workforce and getting as many people back to work and re reinvigorating our economy. The immigrant workforce is a huge part of that. I grew up in Los Angeles and went to college in San Diego. And since 1985, I've been fighting the World Bank and neoliberal investment policies around the world. So. I look at things holistically. I look at, first of all, why are people coming here? And that's where the World Bank connection comes in. It comes in because we are destroying the subsistence economies around the world. So first of all, we've got to deal with that. And program I'm advocating for our country is a program that we should have in every country. Every country should be moving off of fossil fuels and nuclear and moving towards supporting everybody in their country. I also advocate, in general, a politics of compassion and wellness. Living in San Diego and Los Angeles, I saw the neighborhood I grew up in change after I left there and listened to my friends talk about the problem. So I'm also extremely sympathetic to the people who are having impacts from people coming in. So I think we also have to consider the impacts in the United States. Thank you. Uh, I'm a very strong supporter of the Federal DREAM Act. I want to say, too, that uh, the consequences of NAFTA, environmental, labor, human rights, uh, have been in many instances uh, catastrophic, whether it's the Mecklenburgs across the, around the border, uh, or the uh, driving of people off of the farms to the cities and then north. I have a strong record before NAFTA was passed, going on radio, TV, writing, trying to prevent passage of NAFTA, because in real time this corporate agenda needs to be challenged. I also uh, do want to note that for so many millions of people to live in the shadows, is you know, heartbreaking for the families, for those of us who are friends and, so to speak, loved ones of those people, relatives or not, but it's very lucrative for some big conglomerate employers. And I think we need to make common cause with so many uh, compassionate people, realistic, hard-headed people, to see that this has to change. We have to have comprehensive reform that ends this living in the shadows for so many millions of people. Um, the language on the Statue of Liberty is pretty clear. Uh, we're all kind of, kind of immigrants of one sort or another. Um, Convention obviously is very important. Costs are going to become incredibly complicated over the next year. Um, and at 1.2 trillion is the low-hanging fruit. They're trying to cut 5 trillion. Uh, it just It's going to be a very ugly roll forward. Um, and there could be a tide and people start moving across the border the other direction. But in the meantime, we really we need to look at an avenue by which they can be uh, assimilated into the culture. They can learn the language. They can learn the skills. They can do jobs that um, many Americans are unwilling to do. Um, having spent uh, a couple of trips to China and witnessed how individuals work who really want to work and how hard they work, um, it's 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 a complicated situation where these are people that um, want a job, want a livelihood, want a future for their children. And we need to give them, there needs to be an avenue for that to occur, and for people that are here, they need to be recognized 
uh, the same way that we're recognized. Well, I support uh, comprehensive immigration reform. That does not mean I support illegal immigration. I don't support a blanket amnesty. I do support giving people who are here, playing by the rules, working in our communities, a way to earn their way to citizenship. Get in the back of the line. Learn English, pay your taxes. And I think if we do that, it's only fair that we give them a chance to become citizens through that process. I'm a huge supporter of the DREAM Act. We've heard support from everyone from the DREAM Act. I actually helped pass, though, the California DREAM Act. And I'm excited to tell you that in, in just a, a few days later this month, uh, the author of the California DREAM Act, Gil Cedillo, who's supporting me uh, for Congress, will be here in San Rafael. We're also doing an event in uh, Sonoma County. I hope you will join us. You can get the details on that event at jaredhuffman.com. Thanks. Thank you for this question. It doesn't come up very often in this race. Um, as someone who's been a supporter of the DREAM Act and has been speaking out publicly around this issue, I personally don't find the topic controversial. And, um, and I think the more that we can um, uh, take the wind out of the, uh, some of the language surrounding it, things like um, the issue of calling people illegal and, um, and recognizing that um, no one is illegal. And we can really get to the root of the problem, which isn't the people that are here, that are a part of our communities, that are um, working and um, striving to, to make a, a dream for their family, but it's to address the immigration system itself, which is broken and has been defunded um, and keeps people from being able to receive documentation in a timely fashion. Um, I know people who've been trying to become documented for almost 20 years. Their own parents are already documented and they're young adults who are not. Um, and so we have to address the system that keeps people from being documented in the first place by funding it. Thank you. So I think you're hearing pretty unanimous agreement here that we need comprehensive immigration reform. Interesting that Senator McCain was one of the leaders in trying to get that to happen, um, and, it, and it failed miserably. And we have very porous borders, so it's not just south of the border that's an issue, but our Canadian borders as well. And undocumented um, residents of our community don't just come from south of the border, they also come from Asia and Africa and Europe. And so we have 12 million people in this country, at least that we know of, who are here, many of them working and contributing and part of our economic environment. I believe that we do need to um, fast track uh, uh, Im our immigrants so that things like what uh, Tiffany's talking about aren't occurring. I've heard similar stories. So it's just a long and tedious process. And if you've been living and working in this community and contributing to the community and part of the economic and workforce, we need to find a way to make that work. We have time for about uh, one or two more questions. Um, from the audience, um, this person said that uh, they heard one of the candidates say that he will not give an inch on the issues. Does he think uh, this is the best way to get bills through the legislator, legislature and ultimately sign into law? How do the other candidates um, on the panel feel about this? So I think one of, the, one of the big challenges that's going to be incumbent on whoever you elect into this office is that they hold your ideological values, but they also know how to get the job done. That we've seen a Congress that has retrenched into a very divisive partisan debate that is um, uh, not getting anything done for citizens. Like the, the commitment to solutions and moving solutions forward has ultimately dissolved. And even five years ago, you'd see this debate across the aisle that folks would still go to dinner together, they'd still have a drink in the bar, and you'd see legislation move through that helped American citizens. So what I offer you is a progressive a Democrat who holds the ideals of things like choice and marriage equality, and getting out of wars we shouldn't be fighting, and protecting our environment, and someone who has a 20-year track record of being in the trenches, making deals, getting, job, getting the job done, and, and moving solutions forward for real people. And I think that's, that's going to be the challenge for anyone in this role, that um, in order to stand up against the Republican right and to hold the ideals and hold the ground that we want, we need someone who actually has been in the trenches and has a credible track record of doing that. And that's what I offer to you. It's not about not giving an inch. It's about knowing when you have to fight and when you make deals. 
When Operation Rescue showed up here in 1989 to blockade a clinic, clinic for women's health to prevent them from permitting, uh, um, performing abortions, I showed up here with Baycor and I defended an abortion clinic. In 1987, when the first genetically engineered microorganism was going to be released in the environment, I organized the first opposition on the planet to fight genetic engineering. And we sabotaged the test site by pulling up the strawberry plants. We did it again and again. And what happened was the investors thought that they would never see a return on their product. They pulled out their money, and the company went down. Further, there were supposed to be 30 more tests in the next two years. There have been none anywhere on the planet since 1987. I'm talking about using what you know to bring down other people. And then when they're feeling pressured, that's when they start to give in. That's when you negotiate. This is a very important question and this crystallizes one of the important differences in this race. To know the difference between compromise and capitulation on, on core values. Compromise is necessary for leadership. It's often, often, often necessary for legislating and governance. There are some issues that are so profound that to compromise is a betrayal and I won't do it. One is a woman's right to choose. If there's legislation that's going to mean in Kansas or South Dakota, women don't have full reproductive medical services, I'm not going to say, well, I'll meet you halfway. Another example is civil liberties. I want a First Amendment, not a 7 8 of Amendment, not a 15 16 of Amendment. We've got to be willing to define what is core to our values and our future and stand for those values. Um, the corporate congressman who has a special interest, they go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, and that's what happened when they tried to elevate the uh, debt ceiling last August. You, you saw them. There was no communication there. Um, on the anti-protest law, not one Democrat opposed it. They all voted for uh, eliminating willful uh, terminology, making the standard lower so that the federal government could prevent people from expressing themselves, assembling, and seeking redress on federal properties or in the presence of federal elected officials. Um, there is, we, we need to look to new solutions. Um, and one thing about being a psychiatrist, um, I worked in community health, uh, and I dealt with families who uh, would become psychotic over conflict. Um, and I, I've, so I've seen it from that level up through, uh, you know, just plain conflict resolution. I, it's not really going to help if we don't change the structure of the corporate representation. I think this is a question about your ability to function with others and get things done. Uh, you're not going to find a single case where I've ever compromised, much less capitulated on core values. And I include a woman's right to choose in that. I include our environment. I'm not going to negotiate away vouchers to public education. I'm not going to negotiate away uh, any number of things that uh, speak to core values. But how you have your disagreements and how you engage with people when you disagree is critical to your ability to function and get things done. Because when we're done fighting about the abortion issue or immigration or any number of other things, we need to be able to get to work on the next issue and possibly produce an outcome. And that's why, uh, while I've been true to my core values as a legislator, I can also join with Republicans and help save our state parks, like I'm doing right now. And I'm proud that I have bipartisan legislation to do that. I'll bring that functionality, core values, and results to Congress. This is a great question, and um, as someone who comes from a very diverse family, both politically and culturally, I have learned how to navigate those waters and um, still be able to sit down and have dinner and have great conversations um, with people that I completely disagree with. Um, and, and I've been able to take that with me to council. I've been on a majority and I've been in a minority, and sometimes those vary week to week. Um, you know, but I, I'm able to stand my ground and uh, not capitulate and not compromise when it matters. 
Um, for example, on our um, local issues, we've got a Dutra asphalt plant that's coming to town um, thanks to our supervisors, and we've been able to garner unanimous support um, with past councils and almost unanimous support to appeal this process. And um, that was that came from not stand not compromising, but standing my ground and encouraging my council to move forward uh, in opposing that plant. And then last week, um, being able to vote against a project that I didn't want, but work on um, making it a better project, even though I didn't support it. Thank you. Having been in politics at the local level, I've been in the trenches. I fought some pretty tough battles. We were able to. Um, get the media center, public media center, after a long, difficult challenge with um, Comcast. I've uh, been able to bring the Marine Clean Energy program over, and I have been able to uh, negotiate a deal between the quarry and the community. It was a very difficult uh, deal. Many of you remember that battle. It took eight years. I think it comes from being able to talk with opposing sides, to bring people together. I think it's a skill that women bring to the table to try to find a way to present data, to have a conversation, and to try to solve the problem and find the common goal that we have. Um, I do want to challenge uh, Stacy's claims of 20 years in the trenches. I think um, you may have been in high school or college 20 years ago. And the, the issue about creating jobs and having all this experience in health policy, I don't know that that's actually been based in any kind of data that I've uh, been able to collect. So I'd like to hear more confirmation about uh, those claims, because I think it's easy to make claims, um, but I have a public record. Um, my, my core values about getting money out of politics and ending the corruption in Washington, I think, um, Privately, everybody agrees with me. There's nobody that has a problem with that. Um, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. I sometimes say that I'm a doctor of relationships. And relationships, we either have them or we don't. And if we have them, we're capable of standing, not only standing up for ourselves, but connecting and joining with the other and working things out. This is a concept that is universal in healthy families, and it's a, it's a, a a value that I hold dearly. There's big, big problems. Our planet's at risk. Our economy's at risk. Our democracy is at risk. Um, it's, we really need grown-up, common-sense adults to sit down and work things out. The people that are back in Washington, 90% of us think they're a joke. Thank you. Next question comes from the audience. What is your position on desalination? the introduction of GMOs into our food supply, and smart meters, all of which pose a danger for the environment and public health. What was the first one, smart meters? Was there GMO and? Desal, desal, smart meters, and GMOs. <clears throat> I think a lot of these projects are presented because of the model we have of a corporation wants to do something and then they throw it onto a community and then the community has to deal with it. Uh, basically, I oppose all three of those, but it's not for me to oppose them. What I'm trying to organize is how do we go? What is the way we want to have things? I'm talking about we have to build an infrastructure around the entire country where people meet their needs, food, clothing, shelter, education, all the rest, as close to home as possible, because the, fast, the easiest way to cut fossil fuels fast is to stop using them. And if you stop shipping salads from Central California to Toronto, you're reducing fossil fuels super fast. So these mega projects are not at all what I have in mind. I, as I mentioned, uh, BBC considers me a world historic figure for my work in genetic engineering. And right now I'm working on the GMO labeling initiative. In fact, as your congressman, I'll tell you right now, Monsanto is my number one target. Yes, uh, on that note, you know, Monsanto has really swayed USDA policy, unfortunately, under this administration. Again, we need independent, progressive Democrats willing to speak out. Uh, I've opposed desal for many years. Uh, I believe in conservation. Let me repeat, I believe in conservation. Wall Street ain't interested in it, but we are at the grassroots. GMOs have worked against uh, certainly accurate labeling, but that's not enough. 
and at the Institute for Public Accuracy, which I founded for many, many years. We, around the country, have raised fundamental questions about GMOs, Monsanto, and so forth. Smart meters, PG&E has been high-handed, to put it mildly. As President Obama said when he was campaigning, we can disagree without being disagreeable. I disagree with the idea of taking money from PG&E while in the legislature, and you know, Derek is coming next so he can explain why he took so much money from PG&E while in the legislature. I don't think that's appropriate for a legislator to take money from corporations and then vote on a legislation that will affect the bottom line. These are not philanthropies, these are corporations. Um, the fresh water situation is dire and going downhill fast. Water tables dropping in the U.S. Um, desalinization may be a global effort. Uh, it may be an important source for the creation of fresh water as resources begin to evaporate. Uh, GMO, I'm a microbiologist, have been all my life uh, very involved in cannabis. They've placed the terminator gene in cannabis. Uh, you create allergies. You suddenly are allergic to a food substance, which can reduce the size of the heart attack by 66% devastation uh, to allow kind of profiteering, predatory profiteering in, in a global genome that should be another global asset. Um, uh, smart meters uh, obviously has a very strong emotional uh, appeal and it's I think individual right as the level of radiation that you expose yourself to. Um, <coughs> currently we are super saturated with radiation and to single out one particular issue um, it, I mean, it gives us a chance to begin to understand the extent and depth of the other radiation that we subject ourselves to on a daily basis. Um, labeling GMO is important, and I'll get back to you later. So on desal, I supported Measure S. Uh, I have done more than anybody you're going to hear from in this campaign to advance conservation and water recycling, but I agreed with Measure S that if those don't prove to be enough, to keep a reliable water supply and to meet our obligations to Lagunitas Creek, that desal is the least of the bad alternatives that we have available and it should be in the planning portfolio. So I was with Measure S. On GMOs, uh, I've been able to pass the only legislation in California providing safeguards against GMOs and uh, authored a salmon labeling measure, which unfortunately failed this year, but I'm hopeful that we will pass a bigger uh, food labeling initiative this year, and I support it. That's an important safeguard we need uh, for GMOs. On smart meters, we, let me be clear, we need a smart grid, we need smart meters. That does not mean you need to have a single wireless-based technology that's forced on everyone, even those who believe they are RF-sensitive. So I have been pushing for uh, a hardwired alternative, uh, which is reasonable, and we now uh, at least have some alternative. It's not going to please everyone, but in, in large part that is because of some of the advocacy that I, that I have done. Uh, I am opposed to the desalinization that's been presented in Marin County. In Petaluma, I've been a proponent of our wastewater treatment facility that uh, addresses uh, our water demand through recycling uh, tertiary water and have fought on uh, that issue for many years as it's um, been um, brought to the voters a couple of times and may come back for another time. Um, smart meters, I think, are a personal uh, issue and people need to be able to have those um, ability to opt out and I think that's um, just certainly been a good start. Uh, with genetically modified organisms, I am um, very excited for um, the Petaluma Seed Bank, which uh, has been hosting our newly founded Grange that I helped bring to Petaluma. Its focus is in, in organic farming practices and um, certainly protecting our heirloom seed stock. And so I've been working very hard on the uh, Label GMO initiative and uh, also see Monsanto as a very big target and we'll work against them in DC. Thank you. So I'm not a supporter of the desal. I think there's a lot we can and we are doing right now with reclaimed water for irrigation, with zero net increases in water use on our built environment, which we put into our uh, county general plan codes and our new um, uh, and water conservation approaches. On the GMOs, I support the state labeling and for the initiative that's out. And I worked on the Marin initiative, which made Marin County one of the first um, counties that does not allow growing of GMO organisms in our agricultural programs. With smart meters, I think consumers need a choice. 
Um, wireless smart meters shouldn't be forced on anybody. The consumer should have a choice. I have not been a friend of PG&E's with the launch of the Marine Energy Authority. Um, I also think that, it, that we raise the questions about um, how they spend some of their revenues that they collect. When they spend $50 million of ratepayer money to launch a campaign to protect a monopoly, I think that says a lot about uh, where PG&E's interests are, and it doesn't seem to always add up to consumer support. I think we can get lost in local small details. While they're really important, it's also important to take a look at the big picture. We need to restore Mother Nature. Right now, we're using our bay, our waters as an ashtray and dumping stuff into it that shouldn't be there. We need to reverse that. Mm -hmm. The same thing with our agricultural policy. We need to restore our agricultural lands to nature. We need to go back to organic farmers, small farmers, but that's not gonna happen because right now Congress is bought off and paid for by six multinational corporations. When it comes to energy, I'm a fan of Jeremy Rifkin's work. Uh, it, it's been going on for decades in Europe in his latest book, The Third Industrial Revolution. We need completely sustainable post-carbon energy. We need to have a smart grid where that energy is, is sent around and locally stored. And we need to go to a completely electric fleet of vehicles. So I think that our food systems are actually one of the looming crises that we're hearing too little about in our press, that like the environmental crisis and climate change, our food systems and GMO is actually a, a major issue that needs to come more to the public fore. I'm, I'm a strong supporter of labeling and making sure that uh, GMO products are, are sufficiently packaged and labeled so that consumers can make their own decisions. And as it relates to um, smart meters, I think that a critical thing that we need to do is start making our own energy energy again in order to unleash the power of solar and wind and other renewable and alternative energy sources, that we do need a smart grid and that consumers need to be given choices, alternate technologies and how, in terms of how that gets deployed um, for their own safety. I do also want to confirm that the mathematics are correct. I've spent 20 years in technology and manufacturing and small business and uh, if, uh, Susan would like to see the record for that. I'd be happy to show her afterwards. But uh, it is true, while I may look a little young, uh, 20 years is the amount of time I've been in the workforce and committed to building small businesses, helping young people build small businesses with over a dozen of them that I've personally been involved in creating. OK, I one more, one applaud more the audience for they're all still here. And they all are very fascinated. We thought we'd ask one more question. Just to are you sure? <laughs>
the ability to have exchange without a lot of uh, corporate special interest going toe to toe. Um, areas of special interest are problem solving, uh, a very demonstrated history of the ability to uh, do research personally, uh, find problems and bring those problems into resolution uh, using that uh, lucid dream skill that I learned as a psychiatrist. Uh, a very strong interest lived on the coast for 20 years. There's only one congressman now protecting 600 miles and I certainly commit myself to not allowing any changes in, in the oil drilling during that period. It is a source of uh, hydrokinetic energy that we need to exploit. I think I'm unique in the sense that I'm the only candidate running on a record of legislative accomplishment. And uh, I'm very proud of that, representing this district the last six years in the assembly. It's a dysfunctional place, Sacramento. All of your worst perceptions are pretty accurate. Uh, but I've been able to overcome a lot of that dysfunction and while staying true to my values, actually pass over 60 pieces of successful legislation, including bills that are really making a difference out there on clean energy and creating jobs, protecting our environment. I've gone to battle against some pretty powerful interests, the health insurance lobby uh, and others. And I think I've proven myself as someone who can get results in a legislative environment and that is unique uh, in this race. The last thing I'll mention though is that I'm deeply connected uh, to this community and have been for a long time. Uh, raising my family here, I live just down the street, my kids are in the public schools, I've been active as a volunteer, uh, as a parent, 12 years in local government. I love this place, it's a big part of why I want to represent you in Congress, and I'd be honored to have your vote. Thank you for having us tonight. It's been a, a great pleasure to be back in Marin County. I am uh, very excited to be running in this race. It's a historic uh, campaign uh, to become the ninth Latina elected to Congress in United States history. I believe that uh, what I have to offer is different in that I've been working in my community, for my community, for over 20 years. I've lived in Marin County, Sonoma County, and have um, spent a great deal of time on property in Mendocino County when I was young as well. I'm deeply connected to the environment, and I don't compromise on those issues. I'm a strong fighter and uh, someone that will go to DC knowing what the issues are um, for local governments and fight for our local governments and bring back um, those resources that our district needs knowing what those needs are, having worked in that um, area without the baggage that um, many other people bring to, to DC, having been in politics for many, many years. I've only been in politics for three and a half years, and so I feel I'm an independent person, um, strong-minded, strong-willed, that can represent this district in a very fair way. Thank you. So I've been a resident of this community for 25 years. I raised my children here. They went to public school here. I'm I think the strongest woman candidate. I've delivered the goods as a policymaker at the local level on a number of very controversial issues, and I showed political fortitude in getting them over the finish line. I'm not afraid of the tough battles. I'm a women's health nurse practitioner, so you know I'm gonna fight for women's right to choose what happens inside of her body. I'm also a professor of nursing and an educator, a mother and a grandmother, and while our policies may all sound like we're saying the same thing, it's going to be important. The lens that we bring and the experiences that we bring. Um, unlike one of the candidates who's only lived in the community for two years, I think it's important that people that are living here in the community have some kind of civic engagement in this community, whether it's creating jobs here or whether it's reading to children or coaching soccer or having your children involved, I think it shows that you have skin in the game in the community that you're asking your constituents to send you to Congress to be their voice. And my experience, I think, in my public record speaks volumes. I've lived here 30 years. I think um, I differ from a lot um, in, with my stance. Uh, I'm a licensed psychotherapist and a, with a strict code of ethics, and uh, having a dual relationship is considered unethical. And I think that accepting money from someone we regulate or legislate is unethical. It is wrong, plain and simple. It's something that is glossed over by just about every prominent polit politician up here and for sure by everybody back in Washington. If I'm elected, I'm going to go back there and hold that stance very strongly and piss a lot of people off. I'm going to I intend to take a photograph of myself standing on the steps of the Congress saying, this body is corrupt. And I 
will lead on the first Saturday of every month at noon a gathering of people to, to protest, to march, and to hold up signs saying, this body is corrupt. Until we get money out of politics, until we get politicians not accepting money, I believe it is unethical, it is wrong. Do not vote for them. Thank you. So what makes my candidacy unique is that on the topic that is most on people's minds right now, which it happens to be the economy, job creation, getting people back to work, restoring our middle class, I'm the candidate that has the most depth of experience, who's been in the trenches, created hundreds of jobs, dozens of young companies, and, and knows from a policy perspective what it takes to start making things in America again, to revitalize our, our small business landscape, and to make sure we can put all Americans back to work so that they can live at the American dream. The other piece that I'd like to say is that uh, there's been a, a legacy of a strong, progressive woman in this seat for over 30 years with Lynn for 20 and Barbara Boxer before her. And a whole host of progressive women's organizations have endorsed my candidacy as the leading female in this race. So Emily's List, Women's Campaign Fund, uh, State Senator Noreen Evans, Jennifer Siebel Newsom, who does a lot of work with women and girls, have all supported uh, my candidacy to keep a strong progressive woman in this seat who will fight for the values of this district and bring a deep, deep track record for getting folks back to work. <coughs> In 1956, Los Angeles had the worst smog ever. In 1957, I was born, and the day I was born, I turned, looked out the window, saw the smog, and coughed. Ever since, I've been fighting for a whole thing. <laughs> I'm the only candidate here who has lived, worked, and fought for all six counties. I lived a mile from here, over on Bell Avenue, after the open firestorm destroyed the home that my girlfriend and I lived in. So I'm the only one who actually knows the entire terrain. I also know the ecology of this area. I don't have a lot of faith in people who have experience in government. You look at what's going on with this, the state, and my friends who are on SSI have had state cuts that have cost them their glasses, their dental care, and mental health. People are dying because of what's going on in the state government. And I think if someone can't fix that, they're not going to fix anything in the federal government. Further, uh, if someone's going to take contributions from any other candidates, I don't know that they're going to stand up to those candidates when they have to run for re-election in two years. So I'm taking no money from any other candidates. And lastly, I'm inventing a new way where we can use community organizing and the internet to reach as many people as a million dollars worth of ads reaches, and it's working. I get more votes for a dollar spent than any of the other candidates. I get more than 30 votes for every dollar I spend. All right, thank you very much. It's been a stimulating evening. <laughs> If you haven't signed the GMO initiative, it's out there. <laughs> I'm sure there's lots of literature out there if you want to uh, review it. Um, all right, our candidates are free to um, go into the lobby. Can you hold on? Can we announce uh, two weeks?